Uh, my name is Rick Elrod. Uh, I am on the Community Platform Engineering team at Red Hat, and uh, I work mainly on Fedora's infrastructure. I do uh, a lot of sysadmin tasks. I uh, kind of also sp occasionally spread my time to uh, other teams, like the, the websites team, but I focus primarily on uh, infrastructure sysadmin work. Uh, and I want to talk about the onboarding process. I want to talk about um, you know, getting new newcomers to you know, be able to easily volunteer and contribute. Uh, to the infrastructure and kind of how to retain them once they show some interest in doing that. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background why we care about this problem, uh, talk a little bit about the history of the infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we currently handle newcomers and, and onboarding new people um, and how to retain them and then I have some ideas that I'm just going to kind of toss out. <coughs> uh, first things first, these are all my my opinions, these are not necessarily the opinions of anybody important in the project. Uh, these are just my opinions. The ideas might be horrible, but hopefully not. These are you know, just things that I, I think might help uh, that I'll talk about. Uh, so personally, I started out as a volunteer in uh, 2010, eight years ago. Um, and in many ways, this has been a, a, a very life-changing uh, event for me. I've made, I've made many friends in the project. Uh, I've gotten a lot of experience. It's just been, you know, a, a great thing. I, I wouldn't change anything about it. Um, and I care about Fedora. I care about the contributors, the infrastructure, and the continued success of the project. Uh, why should you care? Well, the infrastructure, of course, plays a very critical role in, in Fedora. Um, without the infrastructure, the project isn't going to get very far. And uh, the infrastructure is inherently community-driven. And I'll talk, about, uh, I'll talk about why that is. So this is an email uh, back on the mailing list from 2005. Uh, it's from Elliot Lee. And uh, this is the first thing that I and other people I've, I've spoken to can find that talks about um, the Fedora infrastructure being kind of an open community-driven thing. So this is saying uh, you know, we can get people shell access to the Fedora boxes, and you know, we can kind of start encouraging the community to have access to these boxes and actually start you know, playing a role in uh, in maintaining the infrastructure. So this is kind of the first uh, first call for help that I can find from the community, um, and it goes back all the way to 2005. Um, since at least this point in time, Fedora infrastructure has been what I will call an open infrastructure. Um, we've encouraged uh, contributions from the community, and um, that email that I, that I referenced was uh, sent out right before Fedora Core 5 came out, so right between uh, Fedora Core 4, 4 and Fedora Core 5. So this, uh, this process of, of the infrastructure being open kind of goes back quite a while. And I just realized I did not start my timer. <laughs> okay. Um, in 2007, uh, we started using the Puppet configuration management tool. Um, and you know this kind of gave a central place, a, a central repository for our configuration files and uh, other system, uh, you know, scripts and, and uh, inventory. And we gave volunteers access to this repository fairly liberally, uh, but it wasn't officially "quote unquote" public uh, because back in the early days, it had passwords and, and other information stored in, in the Git history that we didn't exactly want public. Uh, but we did, we did give access to it fairly liberally. Um, and in 2011, we started the FI Apprentice Fast Group, which I'll talk about quite a bit. Um, and that's kind of the, that leads us to where we are now. So the FI Apprentice Fast Group, um, the idea was that anyone who had an interest in kind of helping out and, and seeing how the infrastructure works, getting some experience, becoming a part of the community, uh, could sign up, they could join the FI Apprentice uh, fast group, and they would get access to most of our boxes. It would be read-only access, so they wouldn't have you know, pseudo privileges, but they could go in and explore, they could see how things are set up, they could see our monitoring systems, they could see uh, you know, our, our configuration tooling and how, how we use it. Uh, again, we add people to the group fairly liberally, and we have kind of semi-automatic removal for people who are not using their access. And by semi-automatic, I mean Kevin kind of goes through and sends an email out every month. Uh, the idea, at least, was, it, was for it to be more automated. Um, 
from the perspective of a new contributor, um, you know, the, the process is they kind of they send out an, uh, an email to the infrastructure mailing list. They express some interest. They say, "Hi, you know, I'm so and so. I want to help out." Uh, people, you know, respond to the email. They say, "Can you join us at our next weekly meeting? Introduce yourself. You know, talk to people. Tell us what specifically you want to work on, and we'll help you get started." Uh, then they come to. Uh, we tell them at the meeting, you know, come come to the Fedora admin IRC channel, and we will add you to this FI apprentice fast group, and you can you know get access and start seeing how things work. So they get sponsored into FI apprentice. We also tell them we have infrastructure office hours every week. So if they have questions, they can come in, and you know this is an hour dedicated just to working with newcomers and and helping them uh, get familiar with you know with the infrastructure, with any problems they're having, they can ask questions, and you know this this time is dedicated for them to get help. So I want to talk about uh, retaining newcomers once they express interest, once they get sponsored into this FI apprentice group. Um, a couple of very unofficial and cursory statistics. Uh, we seem to, every week in our meeting, we seem to kind of average between one and three uh, newcomers expressing interest. This varies every week. You know, sometimes, sometimes we don't get any, sometimes we get more. But I would say, you know, on average, between one and three people express interest at our, at our meetings each week. Um, but we kind of, if, if you look at uh, the Fedora admin logs that happen after the meeting, we get less people than that coming in and actually asking to be added once they express the initial interest. Um, there are currently 27 people in FI Apprentice that are not sponsors and not administrators. So uh, these are like actual people who express interest and, and wanted to start volunteering. Uh, we had three people added in June, two people in July. So hurdles. Um, every step that we ask a newcomer to do, so sending out the email, coming to the meeting, going to Fedora Admin, you know, being sponsored, every, every step here has two effects. It probably has more than two effects, but I'm going to talk about two effects. Um, it has the, effect, the potential to re reduce their likelihood to make it through the rest of the hoops. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory. The more, the more work somebody has to do to start volunteering, the less likely that they're going to make it all the way to actually being able to help. Uh, if they do make it through the hoops, though, it shows some level of commitment. It shows you know, they're, they're really wanting to help. They're willing to you know, learn our processes and you know, do what they can to help us out. Um, so again, the, the process is kind of a four-step thing. They create a fast account. They, they send out a, 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 a letter to the list. They attend the meeting. They get sponsored into the group. And then once they do all of that work, we kind of run into a problem where this group is called FI Apprentice, but the users are not actually apprentice. So we kind of leave them on their own. We, we tell them where the documentation is, which is another thing I'll talk about. But we, we, don't, we, we have the office hours, but we, we don't really kind of do much hand-holding. We kind of just say, here's, here's what we have. Like, ask questions as you go along, but you know, this, is, this is it. Um, so I, I think that there are some things that we can do to make that a little bit nicer for newcomers, and I'll talk about those ideas. Um, so yeah, so in, in an infrastructure with you know roughly 600 hosts, this, this includes like build VMs and our staging instances and cloud instances and everything. Uh, it can be it can be kind of hard for people to figure out what to do. You know, documentation falls out of date. Um, you know, some people learn differently than other people. Some people are more hands-on. Some people are visual. Some people, you know, read things and understand it, no problem. So, you know, what can we do to cater to people who learn differently? Uh, how do we encourage people to stay involved once they actually make it into FI Apprentice? Once they, you know, once they express interest and and get access to things, how do we encourage them to contribute to continue contributing? Um, you know, and also, what is in it for the volunteer? Why should they want to continue contributing? And how can we express that to them? So I'll talk about some of my ideas. Again, some people learn differently, right? So some people are visual learners. Some people you know, are hands-on learners. Um, so if we want to start catering to people who learn differently, what if we uh, started doing, and this is you know, something that I, I've, I've talked to several people about, and everyone seems to like this idea. 
what if we did kind of video tutorials, video screencasts that we upload on it could be YouTube or anything else, showing the processes that we do as sysadmins, you know, every day, altering DNS records, uh, deploying new hosts, taking websites out of, you know, the, the, the proxy configurations, all these things that we do. Um, you know, what if we made little video tutorials and we could actually give them to, you know, li link them to people who, who learn visually. And so this is something I've kind of started on in my spare time. I haven't actually uploaded anything yet, but I, I've talked to people. I've talked to Smood and, and some other people, and people seem to generally like this idea. People think this is a good idea. Um, so again, some examples, provisioning hosts, uh, how to run playbooks, how to make playbooks, uh, how to update our DNS. Um, it also it saves some time uh, answering common questions. We can point to the videos that are already made. It does have the potential problem, same as you know with our, our text documentation, it can fall out of date very quickly. So this is another you know, potential pain point. As, as our processes change, the videos will also have to change. So I said some people are also hands-on learners, right? People, some people learn visually, some people learn hands-on. So we run a cloud infrastructure in, in Fedora Infrastructure, where we can spin up test instances, we can spin up you know, all sorts of VMs and you know, all sorts of cloudy stuff. Um, what if we use this as a way to give contributors a kind of playground test environment that looks somewhat like a small scale version of the infrastructure to do whatever they want and learn how our processes work. So, and you know, an, an idea that kind of goes along with this is, is what if we give newcomers a list of, of tasks that they can go through and they can step through the process, they can ask for help on individual processes if, if they're not sure, you know, if they get stuck at one step, they can ask, you know, hey, I, I'm going through this particular checklist, I'm at this step, I'm not sure what to do, can you help out? And we can take a look and help out. So, you know, the workflow would be, you know, they would, they would get into FI Apprentice, kind of similar to how they do now, and then we would launch a couple of pre-configured cloud instances, depending on where their interest lies. So I have a couple of uh, examples. One example, they say, you know, they, they want to learn how to deploy a, a new web app, right? So we, we run a playbook, a couple of cloud instances get launched, all right? One of them is like our Ansible host, so they will learn how our, our Ansible templates work. One of them is like an app server, so like a wiki server or Fedocal or you know, any other web app. One might be like a small database server and one would be like a proxy. So they would learn how all of these different kinds of servers, servers and services that we run kind of interact with each other. Uh, they would learn you know, how, how the proxy communicates to the app server, you know, where Ansible fits into all of this. It would, it would basically be a playground for people to learn our processes in a small scale way where they can't actually break anything because the cloud is separate from our production networks. And you know, it, it, would, it, would, it, it would provide a way for people to learn how things work without actually potentially breaking anything. Uh, another example, say somebody comes in and they want to learn how our monitoring system works. Uh, so we, you know, we use Ansible for our Nagios templates. It's all automated nowadays. Uh, so what if we had something like that? So you know, we, we spin up, a, uh, we, we run a playbook, it spins up a couple of cloud instances. Uh, one of them is like our Ansible host that actually does the Nagios template generation. Uh, one of them is like a Nagios server and one is a host that gets monitored by Nagios. So they can see, you know, how does, how does the monitoring protocol work? How do, you know, how do I add things to Nagios? How do I add new checks to Nagios? So that's, that's another idea that I have. So again, the, you know, the workflow, they would get added to FI Apprentice. We would launch these instances. And then we could give them a, a list, going back to what I said, we could give them a list of, of tasks to, to go down. Um, you know, if they want to learn about monitoring, we tell them this is how you get into these instances. Um, you know, here's how you can start playing with the configuration system and you know exploring. And you know they go down the list, and um, at the end, or you know if they if they have questions, of course they can ask us questions. But at the end, uh, we could kind of you know look at their instances, see how they did, give them feedback if they want. Um, so this encourages feedback. You know, this encourages communication with people who are already active in the infrastructure and with people who are looking to become more active. Um, 
It also lets us see kind of us visually what they are, are focusing on, what they want to learn. And it also provides a clear promotion for, you know, when people want to get promoted out of the FI Apprentice group and actually focus on one area of the infrastructure, you know, we can, we can easily say, okay, you completed the monitoring checklist, so we'll add you to the uh, sysadmin not group, the, not, the monitoring group. Um, you know, you completed the, the web app, the proxy uh, checklist, so we're going to add you to sysadmin web. So it, it provides kind of these, these clear-cut levels of, of how to get added to the, the, the groups beyond FI Apprentice. Uh, this idea, of course, does have some problems. We have to maintain all of that infrastructure. We have to maintain the playbooks that spin up these instances. Um, it's never going to fully demonstrate how the, the pieces of the infrastructure interact with each other. Right? There's always going to be other pieces that interact. You know, in the examples I gave, maybe some of those apps talk to FedMessage, but we don't demonstrate that in our checklist. Like, there's always going to be other pieces that are not covered um, you know, by, by giving people a small scale playground to work in. Uh, there's also the question of, you know, if we start doing these task lists and, and have people go through these, these tasks, what should be on those lists? Um, you know, how, how, do we, how do we bike shed and figure out what should be on those lists? So motivation, keeping newcomers motivated. So what if we had a way to award something like badges for hard work. You can see where I'm going with this. Oh, wait. So we, have th we do have this infrastructure, this thing called Fedora badges. And they are easy to make. They're cheap to make. Uh, they require a tiny little bit of graphic design, but that's about it. They're free to award. They don't cost anything. They make contributors feel good when they, you know, when they help us out. They do something. We want to you know, say thanks. Uh, it's a virtual token of appreciation. And I claim that we should award them. And the infrastructure for doing that is already there. We have this system in place already. So some examples. Uh, going back to you know, the, the cloudy uh, idea that I had. You completed a checklist on your cloud instances. It looks good. Here's a badge for that. You know, thank you for putting in this work, showing us you know, that you want to be involved in this area of infrastructure. Here's a badge for that. Thank you. You submitted a patch to our main configuration system, our, our, our repository of our, our configuration system, uh, Ansible. Thank you. Here's a badge. You know, maybe you said five or ten patches. Here's another badge. Thank you. Um, you know, maybe somebody comes in, they run interference during an outage. So you know, all the, the, the people who can do something to fix an outage are working, but we have a lot of people coming in and saying, hey, this thing is down. But you know, maybe an apprentice you know, is, is kind of running interference and saying, yeah, we already know about this. People are working on it. Thanks for, thanks for letting us know. We're on it. And we can give them a badge for that. So, so my idea is like we, we already have the system in place. It makes people feel good. Let's, let's use more of it. Um, yeah, that's what I just said. <laughs> um, so another problem is that being a newcomer can kind of be scary, right? Um, we have this Fedora admin channel that kind of, you know, people come in and ask questions and, and everyone hangs out in. But we average like 275 to 300 people in there at any given time. And, you know, we, we want to encourage community involvement and, and people coming in and, and people who don't know how things work. We want to encourage them to be able to ask questions. But doing that in front of 300 people can be quite scary, right? That's it's a big crowd to, to get up and... And, and, you know, basically say, I have no idea how things work, like, help. <laughs> so the idea here is, and I, I haven't talked to too many people about this, it's just an idea that I'm throwing out. Uh, what if there were a smaller channel, a smaller place where people can come in and ask questions until they're more comfortable, you know, with how things work and, and interacting with the community at large? So I had this idea of uh, Fedora for newcomers. I have no idea if this will work. I haven't mentioned this channel to anybody before, but uh, the idea would be, you know, limit the channel to infrastructure veterans who can answer questions and people who are new within the last couple of months who are still learning how things work and want a small place, probably under, say, 50 people, uh, to ask questions rather than a place that has 300 people. So there are, uh, you know, a couple of problems here. How do we enforce the, the end month rule? How do we say, you know, 
hey, you're not a newcomer anymore. Like, get out, <laughs> right? Um, and also, does this isolate newcomers? Like, we, this is a community-focused project. We want the community to, to interact with each other. Does this kind of isolate and, and segregate the community too much? We want to kind of avoid that problem. So that, those are my ideas, and I'm going to kind of uh, just, I don't know, we, I guess we can have a discussion. I don't know where I am on time right now, but um, those are my, my big ideas that I have. I don't know what people think of them. I, again, I've talked to some people about these ideas, and people seem to like them overall. Um, another thing that I didn't mention, and I was going to add a slide and I forgot, is uh, Clement has been doing uh, infrastructure office hours. I, I guess I did kind of mention them in passing. Uh, every week, um, and I don't really know how the turnout has been on them. I, I think we've gotten some people coming in and asking questions, but... but yeah, we got two, two apprentices that are coming like, uh, every week. And yeah, we, are, we got uh, on two apprentices that have been coming almost every week since we started, and they're working together on tickets, so I think that's quite nice, uh, collaborating. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much all. Uh, we haven't had too many other uh, other people coming. So, but for me, it doesn't cost too much to just keep it running. You know, I'm there on IRC and um, I'm there to answer questions. So I just want to. I think it's it's better to have it there and see if uh, if somebody comes or, or not. But yeah. So. Uh I'm happy to take any questions on my ideas, or if, I, if other people have other ideas that they want to toss out. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really interested in the idea of having sort of these little throwaway environments uh, for learning. Um, do you have any idea, like sort of proof of concept, or, or just this is like a like an idea? How can you go? Can you say more? <laughs> right. Okay. So the question is about uh, the, I guess the, the throwaway cloud instances for you know kind of a small-scale learning environment. Um, I do not have a proof of concept, and uh, I was... <sighs> new cloud. <laughs> um, so we, we are currently kind of redoing our cloud infrastructure right now, and that's been my focus lately. And I, I, my, my thought was once that eventually happens, uh, I can... I, don't, I have no idea what I just did here. Uh, I can, you know, kind of start playing with a proof of concept once that new cloud uh, is deployed. Um, but no, the, the, my idea, I guess, would be we, we already have ways through Ansible playbooks to create instances that do certain things. So we just write a bunch of playbooks that you know kind of configure a, a small-scale environment for each each area that somebody might want to learn. Seems like we might even be able to just just limit the limit the size and scope of the of the deployment to make it more more functional for. Another thing that I'm thinking here, which is that uh, the open is a key. Actually, I'm going to give you the mic so you're on the report. Yeah. Um, so the SUSE community has uh, something s kind of similar to this in the sense that they allow uh, their users or, or their participants, anyone who wants to learn more about the environment, they allow them a checkout service, so they are given an, uh, uh, like a, an access management role, and that role lasts for up to two weeks, and then everything that they create is then uh, shut down and uh, after, that, after that specific checkout um, time. Uh, and the tools that they use to do that are, are obviously open source. It's it's uh, it's they they have I mean the one that I know is is uh, built on EC2 but it allows for it allows for them to allows for their users to create an environment do with environment what they expect to do uh, they identify the resources that are expected to be deployed and give them sort of a top top budget right in terms of how much spend is associated with that and then after a, a, a specific duration all of that is cleaned up. So. Yeah, 
Yes. That does sound something like what we're looking for. Can you, can you, yeah, point, yeah, maybe even just, you know, something on the mailing list even, or, yeah. Since we're talking about a space for newcomers, so I I have a suggestion to write like part put a part in discourse where newcomers could put their questions and stuff. Yeah, like we have a discourse instance in Fedora. Yeah, yeah. so uh, like this uh, admin part, like admin like Fedora infrastructure could have a section over there where newcomers could like put their questions effortlessly, and don't have the fear anymore of actually. Asking a question in an IRC channel. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. yeah. So I personally have not played with Discourse much. I don't know if anybody on the team has has done much with it yet. But yeah, that's that's an option. Any other comments? Anybody want to throw things at me because of my horrible ideas? Is there a way for a customer, for a um, uh, for a person, you know, one of the apprentices or anyone really, to just provide a question in an anonymous fashion? All right. So could they message message a bot and have that bot uh, put that question back in the IRC channel as a, as a general? Right. right. So uh, so the question is, can can newcomers ask questions anonymously? Um, right now, I don't really think we have a system like that. Um, and you can use any IRC nickname. Sure, right. No, that, that, yeah. that makes it makes total sense. But at a certain point, you're you're kind of getting you're kind of getting tracked. It's okay to be tracked by the bot, okay. uh, but you know if your name shows up and your and your yeah, you know yeah. the, and, and your employer finds out you asked a stupid question. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> uh, you were gonna say? Uh, yeah. So just by experience, I think. So we see on the mailing list a lot of people uh, sending in like their introductions. Uh, oh, I would like to get better in Ansible. I would like to learn Python or things like that. And for me, I think what's what's very difficult uh, for them to get involved in the infra. I I don't really think it's the tools, but it's more the process and how. But much you can be you can be interested in learning uh, in learning Python and uh, say oh I, I, the the guys in Fedora Infra they're doing a lot of Python uh, applications so I just gonna uh, gonna try to join them. But you have no idea of what is it to actually create a distribution and what is um, what is the process involved to actually create uh, the distro. And I think this is very very difficult to to actually get. And because um, if you want to start to help on projects, you have to kind of understand what those projects are doing. So this is maybe a bit more um, on the development side of Fedora Infra, but I think it also impacts the uh, sysadmin and, and, um, and things like that. So maybe we, we have few applications that are not so much um, um, tight to uh, actually the building Fedora, but more like for the community. So maybe those we should maybe try to take care a bit more. But those usually that's the application we spend not so much time because they are not um, that critical for like uh, releasing Fedora. But I think they are the good application for an apprentice to to get started, like badges or. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Pygur is another good one because it's based on Git, uh, I think is like maybe a bit more generic application might be a, a good idea to try to say, oh, you want to help us? So you can we can look at those applications first and then and then slowly learn about um, uh, the process of building Fedora. But just yeah, I, th I think we were trying to do that with the the easy fix system that we created. And we've had varying degrees of su success with that, um, but yeah, I, I I see where you're coming from. I think it, that's a good point. Um, what would you say is the bigger problem that people um, have to get used to? Um, 
general concepts of administration and developing uh, the infrastructure software or more that people get involved into it like oh they are already sysadmins at companies or whatever and then just go in and make something out of it or is it really people who are often try to learn new tools and say oh I can do this in the infrastructure team um. That's kind of a tough question. I, I personally, I think they those two kind of kind of go hand in hand to some extent. Um, I don't know. I again, I, I think there are things we can do to specifically help people become more familiar with our processes, which like the things I talked about. Um, and you know, through doing that, they'll they'll also gain general sysadmin experience as they go um, if they don't have it already. Um, I you know, it's hard to say which the quote unquote bigger problem is. I think they kind of go hand in hand. Well, um, I'm being an apprentice uh, like forever because uh, I used to do sysadmin the old fashioned way and now, right now I'm starting to learn Ansible and I think the um, even when you are really helpful and you answer everyone questions, there is no um, no really easy tag task. I mean, uh, there are mar market as easy fix, but normally you say, okay, this is easy fix, but ha. <laughs> so I think the 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 documentation should improve in in that matter. I mean, this is the problem is this. You call you should go this way at least to to start a uh, research by yourself. At least pointing you in the right direction. It's a good point also that um, it might look as an easy fix for us because we do it every day, and uh, but for an apprentice to say, oh, it, it's tagged as an easy fix, but it's uh, I have actually no clue of uh, what needs to be done, and I think on GitHub they they recommend to use like. Um, um, it's like help, help wanted or a good first issue of something that there is no the connotation. It should be easy for you, and if you if you can't do it, you're just like um, yeah. So might be something we can try to change the tag there and make something yeah. like that. Is it better to say that it's an easy fix in the sense that no matter what, someone else can help me walk through this without without issue, right? So someone more experienced could help me walk through it, and and that means guidance may be necessary, but uh, but it's a fix that we we all can do, right? So what? So one of the things that we can do is while creating the easy fix, so uh, whenever somebody new comes in, the problem they face it, like where to fix the issue and where to find the file. So in that case, th the uh, this problem comes in, like I have to go and talk over IRC or over publicly over the, like on the GitHub issue, right? So somebody who is very shy or introvert, so they fi find that issue there. To even approach someone to ask how to go ahead. So in that case, we can like at least for uh, the uh, easy fixes or the ghost first issues, we can actually write the st steps on um, like this is the where you need to find the file. This is the method you need to edit, and this is. Uh, how you need to approach the complete steps when creating the uh, good first issue and so that it's very easy for them to and it should be like maybe in like five to ten lines of fix that need to do maybe uh, or less even like one two line of so and that can be a good start so so one more thing is so saying did I, did I hear you right that maybe maybe the with, a, with something that we put in that category you could get maybe if it, if it languishes for too long, you can add an extra step, like add first steps or add second yes. steps. Okay. So easy, like you can include the list in there, like uh, when like describing. Uh, when
describing when describing the issue you can write that this is the issue and because this is an easy fix so these are the if you are trying like somebody new is trying to attempt that issue so that person can uh, go through this file and there's the issue there and this is what we want and uh, this is how you can proceed or these are the line of this is the maybe this is the module which is used or this is a module that needs to be used so you can mention all those things in there very clear so that he uh, the person who is going to attempt that particular problem does not need to like ask somebody or directly can so it's basically, so it's basically lowering, the, lowering the, barrier the barrier as, as much can. as we can right and I, I would say we do that over time right so so as the as as this easy fix is identified but then but then it languishes now let's get more let's get more uh, yeah more details on right. the requirements but I think in some cases the easy fixes are not described very well maybe. So it, you say, I want to do this as an easy fix, but you don't describe it enough to know where you need to fix it. Or, but I see what you're saying too. Yeah. I'm a requirements developer, not a, not a creative developer. Right? So, so if, it, so if it, there's going to be something that's done and it's an, and it's an easy fix, then there has to be sort of a defined requirement. Any other comments, questions? Anything? All right. I will give you all 15 minutes back of your life.